let's start with this huge change, this new visit of Poon to China and comparing it with what we've seen from Anthony Blinken's visit to China. And this is the first time we're seeing that she is embracing somebody. And it was so <laughs> amazing. It's unbelievable. What's going on, Ray, in your opinion? Well, you know, I think maybe um, Putin and Xi remember just three years ago when Biden after his first and only in-person summit with Putin, came out and wouldn't stop talking and said, oh, I told him about the threat from China, the, the, the history, and that how China is trying to be the predominant military, and they have this big, big thousands of miles border, and, you know, I shouldn't really say what I told Putin, but he's being squeezed by China. <laughs> okay, getting back to your interrupting remark here, what kind of squeeze? Well, you know, it was outlandish that these sophomores, these, you know, the people advising Biden was telling him that China was squeezing Russia in a bad way because it was just the opposite. And their conduct, their behavior, Sullivan, Blinken, Nolan, and the rest of them, were exacerbating the problem for the United States because Russia and China were going closer and closer and closer together in an unprecedented way. You know, it's very rare that you can use the word unprecedented, but you know, I've been around a long time. I've been watching, and this betrays my age, I guess, I've been watching Sino-Soviet or Chinese-Russian relations for 60 years, okay? My first portfolio was the conflict between China and Russia, whether we're shooting each other across the border, where China was, was claiming possession of 1.5 square kilometers in Siberia, seized by Russia under unequal treaties. And they had a point, those were unequal <laughs> treaties in the 17th century. They were at each long. They were at loggerheads, and of course, they had a big battle for leadership of what was then the international communist movement, which meant something in those days. So I've been watching it since then, and and when I saw that uh, Biden had been advised to 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 tell Putin of all places, you know, we know you're being squeezed, you know, I, I wrote that wrote a lot about that, but now we have the ironic thing where. Western commentators are saying, my God, uh, the Chinese are not given to squeezing, <laughs> not given to embraces or still less hugs. And many commentators have been saying before Putin left China, my God, <laughs> she has hugged him, you know? And so when he left, what happens? Another hug, you know? Well, she doesn't hug people. And Putin is not a hugger either, you know? So what does the New York Times say today? And then we get, get, get more serious here. New York Times just say, oh, wow. In a rare and seemingly deliberate embrace. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> seemingly deliberate to make the point that they're friends, I guess. I mean, well, yeah, it was <laughs> deliberate. So they're talking about th this last final hug that she and Putin exchanged. You know, it's been six years since she made that very odd comment uh, that Putin was his best friend. I mean, hello? I mean, <laughs> you don't really see that in international relations especially between two superpowers. Was she trying to say something then? Yes. To whom? To Blinken and Sullivan and their early, their predecessors and so forth. Look, we have this alliance that has no end. There's nothing forbidden for this alliance. And you ought to, you ought to register that in the United States. Register that because that's the new, well, that's the tectonic shift. And, if I seem over-enthusiastic about this, 
It's because I've been watching this since 1963, when, for example, trade volume was 220 million between these two giants, both communists, but still 220 million. And what is it <laughs> today or last year? 220 plus billion. Now, that's, I think, a thousand times higher. Okay. I'm no math whiz, but that's big. And so the the wonderment real come really comes from the fact that with all this going on, with the Chinese actually showing more aggression or more aggressive tactics in the South China Sea, they just as in their words, they just drove off a US destroyer that was going too close to the islands that they claim. Uh, the note I would make here is that uh, there's a recent study going back to historical documents which shows that China's claims to these islands is quite quite bedrock in international law, uh, given some principles that both that accrue to to nations that uh, that uh, inherit territory from colonial masters. It has it's not all that complicated, but it's it's true. So. If the Chinese decide to cause more problems in the South China Sea, they have international law, not the uh, not the the based system that uh, the U.S. would like to introduce in international law, but international law does. So, the bottom line here is that if Blinken decides to uh, fiddle or play the guitar. Well, China and Russia are joined at the hip with severe implications for Ukraine. So Blinken's in Kiev strumming the guitar. Ukraine is losing. And, uh, you know, it makes a mockery of the people that we have been, uh, that have been advising Biden. You know, he might be a real swell fellow, but he has terrible taste terrible discernment in picking his advisors. And that goes right down the line. I mean, Newland was a disgrace, Blinken, Sullivan, uh, even, you know, General Austin, my God, what a cipher he is. Uh, what, what qualified him? Well, apparently uh, he used to go to mass with Biden's son when Biden's son was in Iraq. Well, right, that's very nice, you know, very, very nice, but doesn't qualify somebody to be Secretary of Defense. Still less does it qualify somebody to betray the fact that this whole war in Ukraine has to do with weakening Russia, inflicting a strategic defeat on Russia, rather than helping the Ukrainians who have lost, and I'll finish with this, 500,000 flower of Ukrainian youth uh, to the machine that Russia is just being now putting into full play against Kharkov and against other places in Ukraine. So uh, we're going to stop there. And I mean, you, you doubtless have lots of questions, but, you know, coming at this Sino-Soviet and Russia-China uh, tectonic shift, and, and that's the way you, you don't get to live very, very, very much longer to see a tectonic shift. Well, I have. And we thought, just to finish up here, we thought, back in the 60s and 70s, that the Chinese and the Russians would hate each other forever. They would continue to forfeit the benefits of mutual, you know, a mutually good relationship. Uh, but then the US was able to exploit that. And when younger leadership came into China, Zhou Enlai and in Russia, uh, the people who succeeded Khrushchev, uh, it was it was a done deal that they realized what would be and had it would be in played. Let's see if we can work out a more decent relationship with China, and that has blossomed into <laughs> not a squeeze, but a fraternal embrace. After May twenty first, Zelensky's term is over, and are we gonna have some sort of elections? Uh, Nima. Um, by, Blinken is behind Zelensky. That's why he went to Kiev to show how much behind, <laughs> how much behind Zelensky he is. Uh, 
Boston is a cipher. He'll do whatever Blinken tells him to do. Sullivan says, oh, wait a second now. We're going to, this might not be such a good year, but in 2025, uh, we're going to have the kind of counteroffensive that we had in 2020. No, no, well, no, this one's going to be successful. I mean, these guys are out of it. I mean, I've seen a lot of U.S. administrations, but I've never seen quite the incompetence. It's not only incompetence, as we've discussed before, Nima, it's arrogance. It's the notion that, hey, we are exceptional and we can do what the hell we please. And that, you know, that used to be so. It's an infantile disorder, as I've said before. And these guys are pretty much uh, groomed in a way that they really believe the U.S. is exceptional. And so that, <laughs> in a word, that's why she decides to make this, what did the Times, New York Times call it? Seemingly deliberate embrace <laughs> of, of put you know, if it wasn't deliberate, I mean, what would that say? I mean, I would, I would say, well, it was spontaneous. He still loves the guy. Well, love is not in the question. The alliance is, okay? And when it's two against one, maybe I'll say this one more, just one more time. In my day, and after um, after the Sino-Soviet real conflict, there was a triangular relationship, like like sort of like this, and uh, and it was equilateral. You know, you had China, Russia, U.S. Now it's isosceles. If you remember your geometry, and the U.S. is clearly on the short end, and the dangerous thing, it's not something to be mocked is the fact that U.S. policymakers and the president himself don't get it. I talked with Professor Richard Wolff about the economy and the situation between BRICS and G7. In his view, the U.S. politicians are at the beach looking at the shore and saying everything is calm, everything is beautiful, while the big waves are coming from the sea. And and nobody seems to care what's going on at the sea and what's coming to the shore. Uh, Nima, Richard Wolf is the best. Uh, you, you want to talk about economists that know what's going on? Well, he's among the best. Now, contrast that with Janet Yellen. When when Yellen was <laughs> when Yellen was yelling at the Chinese for surplus production. You're producing too much. You gotta. You're hurting our economy. You know. Uh, and when others have gone to the Chinese and said, "Look, you know, you you should not help the Russians. Uh, they they might even win. And well, they might not win, but you're know, helping them. They're helping them in Ukraine. Well, the Russians are not doing anything extraordinary to help the Russians in, in Ukraine. The Russians are quite capable of doing what they're doing quite on their own. Matter of fact. Uh, a year and a half ago, the head of national intelligence was asked in a public forum, what about what about this Chinese-Russian relationship? And she, now remember, she directs the whole intelligence apparatus, all 17 agencies, okay? She said, well, you know, we watched the Russia-Chinese relationship and it's not, you know, it doesn't matter much. I mean, they have, they have, they have meetings. They have, they have a lot of meetings. And, uh, and as far as uh, helping, uh, help, as far as China is helping the Russians in Ukraine, we're watching that closely, but it doesn't matter. They're, they're not doing much in the way of that. Now, that was just a year and a half ago. Now, it's very clear that Ukraine is losing. And so there must be some sinister force behind that. And China is nominated and elected unanimously. Okay. And the Chinese are saying, forget about it. Chinese foreign minister spokesman, <laughs> don't try to make us the scapegoat for your losing in Ukraine. You know, we haven't changed our, our trade with, with Russia or anybody else. You're losing and don't blame it on us. So, uh, the problem is, Nima, as you know, that uh, American people don't get the full story on any of this. Uh, they're pretty much brainwashed. And I use the term advisedly. 
And so, you know, if Tony Blinken and, and Sullivan and the rest of them keep saying these things, uh, it's quite possible that Biden sees it necessary for him to beat his chest before, I was going to say before the election, but maybe just before the debate that he's going to have now with Trump. They're just a little bit more than a month away. Uh, traditionally, uh, nominees have had to say, oh, well, how strong we are and look what we're doing and how many victories we have. You know, what's going to happen? Well, no one is more interested in that than Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. So my view is that they're going to keep their powder dry. Uh, Putin, despite the various provocations and the Ukrainians did have some successes in, in Crimea uh, just two days ago in blowing up one of these uh, SA, S-400 uh, anti-aircraft systems and actually just one of their, uh, one of their uh, missiles got through. So despite all these provocations, what I see is a cool hand loop here. What I always see is a, a people saying, look, we are on the ascendancy they still don't realize that they're losing, but let's just a trit, a trit, a trit. And this business having to do with the Russians seizing several square miles uh, outside of Kharkiv. Now, Bielgorod, if my look at the map is correct, it's about 30, 40 miles away from the Ukrainian border. And the Ukrainians have not only shelled Bielgorod in Russia, uh, but they've They've attacked it with, uh, you know, special forces sort of thing. And uh, so the Russians are really aware of that. And uh, so when they saw that the money that the Ukrainians had appropriated to build dragon teeth and other defensive mechanisms there between Kharkiv and the Russian border, when they saw that money being siphoned off to build yachts and places in, in the Riviera for these guys to go, they'd say, well, we might as well go. So they went in just two days ago and pretty much uh, could shell Kharkov from that vantage point. Uh, Putin was asked just yesterday, are you going to take Kharkov? And he said, no, we're not going to. We just, uh, just make sure that nothing. We're going to maybe do a cordon sanitaire, uh, a kind of a buffer zone. Uh, we need that because look what they're doing in Belgorod. And you know, for any impartial observer, uh, that makes sense that the Russians would do that. So a long-winded way of saying that I still see caution, <laughs> despite the ostentatious hugs, okay? I think they're just trying to say, look, we're together now. Sooner or later, you're going to realize you're not going to win in places like Ukraine, like the South China Sea, uh, because, you know, maybe Blinken, maybe Solomon will finally wake up one day and someone will have pinned a map of the world on their wall, okay? And they will see how far away uh, the United States is from Ukraine and how very close Russia is. And they'll see how far the United States away from the Pacific Islands there that China claims, and how close they are to China. They're just off the... So, and maybe they'll say, oh, maybe Obama was right. Uh, maybe countries have core interests. Uh, maybe we should not uh, overextend ourselves and try to make core interests for us where they don't exist for us, but exists for others. And I just want to quote one more thing that Obama said in 2015, which speaks volumes. And that is the worst thing we could do in Ukraine would be to give them the idea, to give them the idea that they could prevail against a much stronger Russia right across the border. And codicil to that, Blinken, who was working for Obama at the time, said, yeah, yeah, because anything we gave to the Ukrainians in the way of military aid, they could match, they could double, they could triple, and then they could quadruple. Blinken said that. 2000, 
15. It's on the record. So what changed? Did they change the map? Did they change Russia's industrial capability? Did they change Putin's desire to protect his core interests, to, to defeat an existential threat as he sees it? And most people agree that with NATO right on Russia's board step, uh, border on, in Ukraine, that would be considered an existential threat. Uh, what changed? Uh, well, Biden came in. And Blinken decided, well, maybe yeah, maybe Obama was wrong. Maybe we could have some fun here. And while, while the battle rages, I can relax and uh, play the, not the, not the violin, but I can play the guitar. But first, let's make sure that they take down all those proto-Nazi symbols there on the wall there, or I'm gonna play the guitar. Please get those, get, get rid of those. <laughs> There have been photos of that wall against which uh, you could see Blinken uh, talking to Huleba, his counterpart. There are no Nazi symbols on there, but the day before there were, okay. That's how bad it is. So problem is American people are blissfully unaware of how we're, we're being led down the garden path. And the election, of course, makes it even more even more tentative. Uh, luckily, as I see it, uh, Putin and Xi uh, see the cards that they have as the high cards. Uh, they're gonna, not going to get involved in any gratuitous dust up, either in Asia or in Europe. But, and this is key, and I've been saying this for two years plus, if if there's a military dust up in, in and around Ukraine, or let's say in and around Syria, where Russian forces still are, or in the South China Sea, you can expect that this hug, <laughs> this, this uh, amicable squeeze, is going to come into play, okay? And if Biden wants to countenance a, a two-front war, well, I wouldn't put it past them because this. His advice is, oh, yeah, we can handle that. Uh, so, again, we come to a infantile disorder, which is otherwise known as American exceptionalism. One of the questions that one of the journalists asked Putin was, if Macron sends troops to Ukraine, what would be the reaction coming from Russia? He said, we're going to tell them when they come. And the, the, it's so amazing, Ray, that we had a member of Bundestag in Germany talking about Poland and Romania using NATO air defense system to shoot targets in the western part of Ukraine. These are unpredictable escalations that can can happen in this conflict in Ukraine. And there could be some devastating, unpredictable reactions from Russia. How do you see these new rhetorics coming from Europeans, from the United States, considering the conflict in Ukraine? Nima, a couple of months ago, when this first uh, issue of sending French troops then into Ukraine came up, Narishkin, um, the SVR, the head of the successor to the KGB, got up and said, all right, well, fine, you do that, they'll become targets. They're not going to last very long. Well, that's the reality. Uh, and Putin does, you know, sort of deflected that question yesterday, if I remember correctly, and said, well, look, you know, this is something you really ought to ask the French, <laughs> you know, ask them if they're going to do it, because if they do it, uh, we already have given our answers to what happens to them. Now, the danger, as I see it, is a domestic political danger in the United States. You have not only... Estonians and Lithuanians and some Poles saying, ah, you know, we got to gotta help Ukraine because it really needs our help. And that should include trainers, okay? Put them in there in Western Ukraine. And you have misguided people in our Congress during our campaign for president who would be saying, oh, well, we're gonna, oh, are we going to leave Ukraine in the lurch? I mean, who lost Ukraine if that if it comes to that? So the pressures domestically, 
on Biden will be as I described them. The saving grace is that Putin has said several times, I can quote him verbatim, uh, foreign, and domestic, foreign and military policy in the United States all depends on domestic vicissitudes, all depends on domestic policy considerations. So in my view, Putin will watch attentively, so will she, and they'll look and see what Biden is capable of saying rhetorically, and then they will respond as uh, as the head of the KGB success that yes, SVR did when Macron first made these noises. All right, you want to be targets? Be targets. You want to put F-16s in there? Well, what airports do you think they'll be able to fly out of? Oh, yeah, we've destroyed most. We can destroy most of those airfields. Are you thinking of? Are you thinking of sending them from Romania or from Poland? Well, forget about it because those airfields will also be struck. Now, there, there would be a problem because the Poles, uh, the others that might be subjected to this would invoke Article 5 of the Geneva Charter. Say, well, look, we've been, we've been attacked by Russia and, uh, you know, that will really be a, a real tough decision to what to do. But the idea is that uh, Russia is trying to warn them against this. F-16s, as soon as they're in the air, can be shot down by very, very sophisticated Russian aircraft. Uh, the problem is that F-16s can carry nuclear weapons, okay? That makes them different. And the Russians have said explicitly, look, because they are nuclear capable, some of them. Now, you might fly, fly some of them up and say, oh, no, these are not nuclear capable. And we're going to say, right, you want us to trust you. Huh? We, we, we verify before we trust. And we can't, in the short time allowed, verify that they're non-nuclear capable. So please, pilots, realize that you're going to be shut down. Um, it's really reached quite a pass with naivete at a high in NATO and in the U.S., uh, including the U.S., and it's uh, campaign season. So if Putin has, you know, if Putin has said several times that he realizes domestic politics will prevail here, uh, I don't think he really has a favorite just like he didn't have a favorite back in 2016. Uh, either either way, you have either we have questionable people with their their fingers on the nuclear codes back in the U.S. So I think they'll just play their cards real tight and uh, respond to any provocation. But uh, I think that given his re remarks yesterday about a cordon, a cordon sanitaire, a, a buffer zone. You know, my notion is that uh, if I were Putin, I would make sure that the buffer zone was large enough to prevent the employment of long range missiles. And I would say, look, uh, let's negotiate. And uh, gosh, he said that how many times now? You know, let's negotiate. And each time he says that, uh, these feckless attempts by people like Jacob Sullivan, you know, about a year ago or so, if memory serves, he convened this international conference in Amsterdam, I think, and there have been a couple since. So what are they going to do? They're going to decide how to how to approach Ukraine, you know. Did they invite Russia? No, they didn't invite Russia. Uh, there's going to be a new one, a new one in mid-June, in Switzerland, <laughs> Lavrov has a real interest. Uh, for, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov has a really interesting rendition about how the Swiss ambassador at the UN approached him when Lavrov was back in New York, and he said, "Now we know you're not going to like this, but uh, but we've been asked by the United States to, to convene this this thing, and don't be offended, but uh, we're going to talk about." Uh, negotiating an end to to Ukraine, and we, uh, we're not going to invite you. Okay, 
we're going to invite China and everybody else. And we think we have 130 countries will come. So, But just so you know, you're not invited. Uh, no. What are the Chinese going to do? They went to a couple, again, if memory serves, they went to a couple of these things in the past. I don't think they're going to Switzerland. I think they'll say, look, you know, on the face of it, you're trying to negotiate an end to the Ukraine conflict and you're not fighting my best friend, Putin. <laughs> you're not fighting Russia. Uh, what, what planet do you come from? We're not coming. Now, I don't think the, the Chinese have said that yet. And I may be wrong. Maybe they see more merit and the Russians see more merit to have China there to... Uh, you know, the kibitz and to say, well, you know, to say uh, interjections at, at the proper time. But but the whole notion that the end of the war in Ukraine would be orchestrated by the likes of Jacob Sullivan by strong arming the Swiss, who sadly used to be neutral. OK, strong arming the Swiss to say, look, go ahead. Get as many countries as you can. Numbers mean a lot, you know, uh, but don't invite the Russians. And here's the Swiss ambassador saying, I'm oh, sorry, but you know, you're not invited. So there's this, this uh, infantile disorder of exceptionalism not only exists within the United States policymaking circles, but uh, to those people who the U.S. can lean on, it's beside me to understand why the Swiss, why even the Swedes or the Finns would forfeit their independent, their neutral status that has served them in such good stead for decades, for decades and decades. Why they would do that at this time? Do they really think the Russians are, are going to invade Switzerland or invade Finland or Sweden? I mean, it it's all a bunch of feckless leaders that have bubble to the top here and don't know how to analyze the strategic ramifications of where they sit and the benefits of having been neutral for many, many decades. So that's the situation. And I, I dare say that makes it more dangerous because as, as Russia looks on at Finland, for example, when the Finns decided to join NATO, Putin's first reaction was says, you know, so long as they don't put NATO military infrastructure there, who cares? You know, we have a friendly border, you know. Well, I mean, what's the whole deal about joining NATO? You put military infrastructure there, and the Finns seem delighted to do that. So, uh, so Putin has to be decided, has to be concerned about that. The more so since the ice is melting way up north there. There's all kinds of mineral deposits there, oil, gas, and others. And there are, there are navigation routes now to China and elsewhere that were never opened before. The Russians can delight in the fact that they saw this coming, you know. They saw the ice melting. And so what did they do? They built ice breakers. <laughs> and they have about 10 or 12 of them and to the U.S., one, I think, maybe two now. So anyhow, uh, there's a position of strength. It's not on the part of the United States, it's part of Russia now with China, uh, bound at the hip together. Uh, and uh, the U.S. still thinking that maybe it can use China against Russia. Maybe we can still drive a wedge between the two. Why? Well, because we're the United States of America, okay? The strongest country, the most powerful country in the world, in the history of the world. I'm quoting, of course, our president talking to 60 Minutes just about six months ago. We know that Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil and the head of South Africa, they said that they're not going to Switzerland to participate in this summit. If Lula is not going there, if South Africa is not going there, I think China is most probably is not going to be there. 
I agree. And isn't that a sign of the times? I mean, uh, Brazil, South Africa, they are not negligible powers. Uh, they're in bricks. And there's a whole alternative arrangement now, which dwarfs NATO in population and eventually in power, the more so if they get together and diminish the value of the dollar and do other things economically and strategically that the U.S. seems blissfully unaware of and unprepared for. The other thing that has happened recently was this attempt to kill the Slovakian prime minister, Fico. And the Sky News was talking about because he was pro-Russian, that's why he was attacked. And and they're calling him communist, they're calling him a dictator. They, 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 their name-calling is coming out of the mainstream media toward this man. How did you find this attack? Well, Nima, I haven't followed it very closely. I did see one report that said he was uh, friendly to Ukraine and that he was really, really upset about uh, the Slovakian leaders uh, uh, looking askance at what NATO was doing. Uh, more arms to Ukraine. Uh, he was against it, as I recall. And this kind of fissures, the, this kind of uh, canyon that is opening up between people like Hungary and Slovakia and a few other countries in in EU and in NATO even, um, it's becoming more and more evident. And you can see either either this fellow spontaneously, or if they look into it and see that the Ukrainian special services were behind us, you could see that that's the length to which they're willing to show that they don't like what's going on when people dissent from NATO sacred scripture. That's about all I can say, because as, as I un understand the inquiry is still going on, uh, they don't know an awful lot about this fellow. Perhaps you know more, Nima. The other thing would be this new law on foreign agents in Georgia. We know that it was approved then vetoed by the president of Georgia. And my question is this. We have seen demonstration against this law in which in, in Georgia, in which foreign ministers of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia are participating in a protest. It's unbelievable why they're doing this in Georgia. Well, uh, the issue, as I understand it, has to do with uh, uh, nonprofits that are receiving more than 20% of their financing um, from external forces, from foreign forces, need to report that. Well, that sounds sort of sensible, especially given what happened in Ukraine. Most people don't realize that there were over 50 uh, national endowment uh, people, uh, units in Ukraine uh, before the war broke out uh, be or before actually the, uh, the coup took place in February of 2014. Over 50 national uh, endowment people. That, that's the successor to the CIA, the CIA covert action Activities were given ostensibly to this new uh, National Endowment for Democracy, they called it. I mean, it was very clear what happened. Uh, CIA is not a good thing to be associated with National Endowment for Democracy. They're involved in Tbilisi in, in Georgia. So, you know, it seems to me that once again, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy had all kind of money to spend. Where should we cause trouble? Well, Ukraine is a little different now. There's a war going on there. Let's go back to Georgia. Now, when, and this is important to remember, in 2008, it was April 3rd, that NATO, in its wisdom, at a summit in Bucharest, said Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. Okay. Wow. Now, that was the Bush administration. And Condoleezza Rice was telling the Georgians, look, we've got your back here. It's going to be just great. You're going to be in NATO. 
And so this guy, Shakashvili, who is a really, really well, he decided he'd, 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 he'd kill a couple of Russians in South Ossetia, okay? They were peacekeepers trying to keep people apart from one another in a very disputed region. And so uh, Georgian forces attacked the Russians. And the Russians said, oh, my God, haven't, haven't these guys looked at the map? <laughs> okay. Well, the Russians were very quick in coming over the mountains and going through the tunnels and giving the Georgians a really bloody nose. Okay, they went up all the way up to Tbilisi, okay, and said, look, enough of this stuff, knock it off, okay? And, to, and the people in Tbilisi, the Georgian leaders, knocked it off. And then the Russians went back to South Ossetia, okay? So what would that mean? That meant that, that when you give these people the idea that uh, you have great support here from the National Endowment for Democracy, which is really the CIA, which is really the U.S. government. Well, you can try these things. Well, finally, uh, people in Tbilisi said, you know, we're going to try to put a rein on these outside influences. We're going to make sure that people who get more than 20 percent of their financing from abroad read the United States of Germany or France or someplace like that, that they report it. And uh, all hell broke loose because people didn't want that to happen. And that's how I understand the situation. I mean, again, I hate to be sort of simplistic here. But if people would look at a map of Europe, you know, if they look at the Black Sea and if they look at where uh, Georgia, the country of Georgia, is strategically placed, okay, and you look at the, the uh, the wish by Russia to have a Black Sea that is not threatening to Russian interests, then you're going to make sure, because you're right next door to Georgia, that the Georgians don't go off half cocked, as they did, misled by the li likes of Kovalisa Rice in 2008, and got a bloody nose. They did that just two months. It was August. What did I say? April, April, May, June, July, four months, just four months after NATO and its wisdom say, oh, yeah, George is going to be a member of NATO, thinking that the U.S. is going to defend them. I mean, the U.S. couldn't possibly defend them. And so if they want to bloody know that's going to happen, uh, I hope I've got that right. I haven't uh, followed that as closely as I, as I might have, but I think that those are the equities there. And Georgia, like any other country on Russia's periphery, needs to realize that that's the way great powers act. And just to wrap this up, it's not just great powers who are aggressive like Russia and China, in quotes. It's great powers like the United States, who, what, two centuries ago, put in something called the Monroe Doctrine by which all outside countries were forbidden by U.S. law to meddle around in Latin America, Central America, or Canada, the United States, okay? So this was not approved by the U.N. or anything like that, because the U.N. was, was not in existence. But if we assert the right to protect ourselves from threats, and, uh, you know, we know about Cuba, that was... 1962, that was 62 years ago, when great powers uh, foresee or discern a strategic threat, an existential threat to their own military, as the United States did when Khrushchev put intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba, then, you know, the U.S. will react just as Russia has reacted in Ukraine. And, you know, the, the analogy is actually more precise since those were what the Russians call uh, offensive strike missiles. Yeah, that, that's the offensive strike missiles. Now, they were already in Cuba. For people who weren't around those days, probably just a little refresher. We didn't know that the Russians put these things in Cuba until the clouds uh, dissipated and we could see down, oh my God, there's an SS-4 inter uh, intermediate range ballistic missile. 
Now, how do we know that? <laughs> well, you know, we had photographed every one of them in, in, in the Soviet Union. It, it has a, a specific character, portrait. It's got a signature is what we used to call it in imagery intelligence. Look, there's a signature. It's as though uh, they put up a sign saying, this is an SS4 intermediate blank. You know, I mean, hello. So we could see it. The question was, were they armed? Were the nuclear warheads in those missiles? Now, this was a year before I joined the CIA, but I know this history really well. They asked the United States intelligence agencies, the CIA, were these things armed? And Ray Klein, who headed the analysis division in those days, and for whom I worked later, he said, well, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all to have these missiles there unless they're armed with nuclear weapons. Uh, we don't know. We can't tell right now. Well, maybe we'll tell after we get a, get through the clouds again and get some more photos from these U-2 aircraft. But you have to, you have to consider that these things are armed. And then Kennedy said, well, how long does it take for one of these SS-4s to reach Washington or New York? And the answer was nine to 10, 12 minutes at most. Whoa. Now, how about the SS-5s that we think are coming in? Oh, well, they can reach Omaha. They can reach all the way into the uh, Houston, the, the whole schmear. So what did Kennedy do? He saw an existential threat. And in those days, there were communications. That's really important. I remember those days you had teletype, right? And Jack Matlock, my good friend who was ambassador there, well, not ambassador then, but he was at the embassy in Moscow. He was translating, you know, translating what Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy and the others were saying. And long story short, the Russians said, oh, my God, look at the map. This is not an existential threat to Russia. I mean, nothing ventured, nothing gained. We thought this is a really clever move. The more so since, since Fidel Castro wanted us to do this. Uh, but, hey, these guys feel really strongly about this. They have the upper hand. Look at geography. And they pulled out the missiles. So did anybody say to John Kennedy, wait a second now, you're putting in a blockade against those ships bringing more missilery into Cuba? That's against the law. That's against internet. You're, yeah, you're calling it a quarantine. <laughs> it's a blockade and you know it. That's against the law, okay? We know parenthetically that that was what prevented the SS-5 from getting through, uh, just, just as the blockade was was put in, those the ships <laughs> carrying the SS-5 was stopped, okay? Now, uh, what's the point here? The point is that uh, um, Russia backed off, the US acted in illegal ways, not only with the, with the quarantine, breed blockade, but also threatening nuclear war, for God's sake. All right, that's against the UN Charter. Also preparing an invasion force to go into Cuba. That too is, you know, not supposed to happen. But that's what great powers do when they feel threatened with an existential threat. Now, the analogy applies to Russia. When the U.S. continued to infringe upon or to violate their promise not to move NATO one inch to the east, if the Russians would allow a reunited Germany? Think about that for a minute. James Baker, Secretary of State, early February 1990. Soviet Union is falling apart. Eastern Europe is, is drifting away from the Russians. And Baker appears in, in Moscow, and he says to uh, uh, the Gadrachov and Shevardnadze, his foreign minister, hey, here's the deal. Now, Baker was from the smart Texas lawyer, okay? So he says, yeah, here's the deal, you know? 
Uh, how would it be? Um, yeah, this is what we'd like. We'd like a reunited Germany. Gorbachev, Shevard Nazi. They all had relatives killed by uh, United Germany. 27 million Soviet citizens killed by a United Germany, okay? So this is a bitter pill to swallow. My God, you want a reunited Germany, huh? So they came back the next day and said, what's the pro? What, what, this is a big quid, a really, really acid, a really bitter pill to swallow. What are you going to, what, what will we get for this? And Baker said, well, now, how would it be? Yeah, how, how would it be if we, if we promised never, ever, ever, cross our hearts and hope to die, uh, ever to move NATO one inch to the east? Of of Germany, a reunited Germany. How would that be? Well, uh, to Gorbachev and Shevard Nadze discredit, they trusted the United States, and uh, and so NATO moved moved and very moved toward the east in violation of the promise. And finally, when Putin had built up the Russian economy and the Russian military, the point where he could say, stop it. He said, stop it. Ukraine and Georgia are not going to be members of NATO. And uh, we tried anyway. You know, when people say, well, it had nothing to do with NATO, I would just say that all they need to do is tell their friends, okay? Tell their friends this, that the head of NATO, Dordenberg, the Norwegian. He's been ahead of NATO, the Secretary General of NATO for the last five centuries, it seems. <laughs> More like a decade or so. Uh, he said openly, speaking before the EU Parliament, September of last year, he said, you know, and this is a virtual quote, you know that the Russians wanted us to sign a treaty where Ukraine would not become part of NATO. They wanted, they gave us a draft treaty and they gave the United States a draft treaty so that there would be no further NATO enlargement. We rejected that treaty. And they said, if you reject that treaty, we will invade Ukraine. We rejected that treaty. So, now, that's the, the nub of it. But this is how how simple-minded people like Stoltenberg is. Here he is before the EU parliament, and he's saying, we rejected that when the Russians threatened to invade Ukraine. And look what happened now. It's uh, The Russians wanted less enlargement, and they got more because now we have Finland, and now we have Sweden. Whoa, you know, they don't really get it. And uh, Stoltenberg is still plumbing for more more support for Ukraine. It's not gonna it's not gonna redound very well to NATO. Matter of fact, I predict that when this is all over, um, after the election in November, no matter which way the election comes out, NATO is gonna be a very, very labile, very uh, very on tentative terms with the world, and there will be people in NATO, like the Hungarians, like the Czechs, like the Slovaks, who will say, you know, enough is enough. We're not going to take diktat any longer from the United States. Look at the trouble we've gotten in. Look at the fact that the flower of Ukrainian youth is now dead. Look at the fact that Ukraine is destroyed. Uh, uh, count us out for the next such escapade. I think that's what's likely to happen, but who knows? So the next couple of months will be very unpredictable, and we can look forward, if that's the right expression, to the first debate uh, just a month from now between Biden and Trump. Mm -hmm.